they pulled out and sirens going like crazy and the medic van was right in front of me and and I don't know what made me do it but I stepped to the side and there was like three feet between the, the wall and the the van and as I looked out this way to, to get a glimpse of him as he drove past I went like that I don't know why but he did the same thing as he went by and it was like a second but it felt like a lot longer than that to see him connect you know that he wanted to see us as he went past anyway that was like three days I think before he passed away he led his crew by example a fireman's fireman just a, a man's man um, just a great guy Tom was one of those, um, in my opinion, a rare individual. He's probably in the top 5% of captains. A firefighter is a rescuer extensively trained to fight fires that threaten life, property, and the environment, as well as rescuing people and animals from dangerous situations. It is one of the most difficult and heroic professions in the world. It takes a very special kind of person to put their life on the line on a daily basis, in a profession where one misstep can lead to tragedy. I was really tired from working and I had been doing laundry and we had dinner and all. And I think I fell asleep on the couch for a little while and I woke up about nine o'clock and the TV was on and I looked at it and they were talking about a, an Orange County Fire Authority captain and they showed him being loaded onto the helicopter. The chief came and I think my mom and sister were standing there. It was the day before for my sister's 18th birthday, which was just terrible timing. Something that has to follow her around for the rest of her life, you know. He left that morning and I remember hearing him leave and my mom um, would always joke that he would forget something so he'd always have to come back in. And I remember standing in the bathroom <laughs> and thinking that I needed to hug him and tell him that I love him. And it was like almost an overwhelming feeling. And I didn't. I told myself I was being silly. And then I would see him later. Born Thomas Oscar Wall on August 15th, 1954 in Oceanside, California. At the age of 15, he met the love of his life, Christine Whitley from nearby Tustin High. Chris said she chose Tom because he was such a patient guy. He was very gentle and was always concerned about what she thought. He made her feel secure. On June 8th, 1974, they were married. Tom's family went to the same church that I did and I kind of watched Tom grow up and so that's, that's where I remember Tom. And, and they, Chris and Tom became interested at that time in each other and were dating. And I can't remember exactly when they came to me and wanted to, or came to just, you know, my wife and I and asked uh, about marrying my daughter. And we, uh, you know, gave our permission and blessed them, you know, going to take my daughter for his bride. And uh, they had th three children during the time that they were together. Firefighting is a risky career, requiring courage to face danger and trauma-stricken civilians. It requires quick thinking as well as physical and mental strength. The number one reason most firemen pursue such a career comes of a burning desire to help and serve others. 
The willingness to take that risk to save someone else on a daily basis is truly the nature of someone with a servant's heart. Tom Wall started his quest for a position in the fire service at the age of 21. After getting his fire science degree from Santa Ana College in 1974, Tom began working for the California Department of Forestry as a seasonal firefighter at Station 15 in the canyons of Orange County, where Chris would drive up to the station to visit him during his 120-hour work week. He was the only married man besides the captain. During these months, Chris became pregnant with their first son, Ian. He was a father, obviously. He was a firefighter. I think a lot of people would describe him as uh, patient and stoic. <laughs> he was um, a kind and gentle person. He was someone who looked the part of an individual who could, I mean, just command a presence in the room because of his size and because of the way he talked with people. But he wanted to be in the background. It was, I guess, those humble qualities that made people just uh, gravitate toward him. He would comment when we'd see some a fire on the, on the news, and if there were firemen hurt, he would tell me, you know, like I would never send, as a captain, I would never send my crew into a, that building when it looked that way. They were more important than the, the building or someone else's property. I just remember how he talked to people. It wasn't so much that it was something that was, I don't know, a signature thing that he did that I remember. He just, the way he talked with people made them feel important, made them feel cared for, made them feel like that um, they were worthy. And with the number of people here that were in some ways hurt or broken or in needing of repair and, and of just, I don't know, re being restored in their spirit. That was Tom's greatest service to people. He made them feel like that they were something. And it was a beautiful thing. More than half of firefighters in the U.S. are married and finding a balance between their long work hours and their time with their families is not an easy task. But being the child of a firefighter does have its benefits. I remember like um, a few times he, he would drive the fire truck to our house. The whole neighborhood would come out and climb all over the truck and stuff like that. So it was like my dad drove a jungle gym, you know, like, <laughs> you know, all the kids would come out and like check it out and whatever. And I, I remember feeling like proud, you know, like, hey, my dad drives this truck, you know what I mean? It's pretty cool. I think my favorite part was probably getting up and pretending to be the engineer because I liked the horn. And so um, I would get up there and pretend I was driving. I just remember them being like fun, like a fun time, a happy time. We always liked trying on their like uniform because it's always like a lot heavier than you think it is. And when you're five, it's like you fall over in it, you know? So I don't know, you're just always happy to see them because it's like you get like this time where they're like away. And then when they come home, you're like, yay! You know, you get like really excited. A firefighter's job is one of the toughest and most hazardous occupations there is. However, curiously, thousands of brave men and women line up every year for the chance to feel what it's like to jump into an inferno with only their courage and training. So what kind of person does it take to be a firefighter? It's not a good profession to, uh, to try to do when you're scared. You gotta keep your wits about you. I knew he had a dangerous job, but he also didn't always, it wasn't until, like, he didn't really talk about it, especially when we were young. He didn't really talk about the dangers of it necessarily, or that he was ever in imminent danger. It was always like he's helping people. He was surrounded by people who all wanted to be safe also. That was their job to make sure others were safe and um, they did a lot of training and he was doing good work. I, I didn't worry about him. I just knew he was doing his job and he was well trained.
you know, as dangerous as the job seems uh, to us when you train like that and you have the equipment that we have, it mitigates the risks a lot and uh, it doesn't seem quite as scary. And the last time I went to the station, I took uh, my youngest son, Joel, and he was 15, and there was another young man at church, uh, Tim Kercheval, who was about 16, I think, but Tim had not gone to the station with us, so we went over there, and you know, it's kind of fun that your dad's a fireman and walking around in there. I just remember it being fun, and like, it was cool to like, see my dad with other firefighters. You know, we got to know some of them pretty well and kind of became like uh, family friends. Kind of sum him up, he's probably in the top 5% of captains, um, maybe even a little higher. In 1980, Tom was promoted to engineer, serving at stations 36 and 7, as well as the hazmat unit at station 4. I was a new firefighter. I was trying to establish my career and what career path I wanted to take. I wanted to go to medic school, that's why I transferred in with Tom. And uh, he helped me get through that process. Even when we were busy, we were running 30, 35 calls a day at the time. And he always uh, helped me even when we made mistakes as a rookie. Tom never seemed to forget anything. You would come on the next morning and he'd have a whole list of things on how his shift went for you. And problems that we may encounter the next day. And just try to, trying to avert problems for everybody, which was really good. He didn't always work at the same station. He would like move around. It was cool to see the different firehouses. Orange County has one of the most rigorous and diverse training programs in the country. We were, were fortunate enough to work for one of the best departments in, in the country and in, in the world probably. Um, they got a call and we were ready to leave anyway, but I had asked you know, the alarm and everything's going off. And so Tom's like, I gotta go, gives us a kiss goodbye. And I said, should we sneak out the front? Or go? he said, just go through the station house. It'll, it'll be fine. And he went over to get into the captain's seat. And it was like, look at that. My husband's a fireman. You know, sometimes it hits you. They, you know they are, but like, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> of course, not every call is life-threatening. Firefighter humor is in a class of its own. Nothing bonds two people quite like laughter, especially in extreme, otherwise grim circumstances. We remember the people who make us smile. Firefighters, most of the really good ones anyway, always have a good sense of humor. Tom was no different. He had a Remarkable laugh. You can hear his laugh from a mile away. He just cared about people. Made friends easily. Everyone loved the guy. Funny, dedicated to the job, and more so dedicated to his family. You, it, it took a lot to make him laugh. I would say that he was kind, and he always liked a good joke. Had a very dry sense of humor, always whispered when he was telling a joke. You walk into the room, everybody turned around, start laughing. Hey, Tom, how you been? While a firefighter is depended on to be the first responder to an emergency, roughly 16% of firemen in the United States have to moonlight with a second job in order to make ends meet. He had like a second job. He was a firefighter, but then he was also a carpenter. So he did like kitchens, raided kitchens and um, cabinetry and stuff like that. And so he did, he always wanted it to look perfect, you know, so he he just really had like an eye for that kind of thing, and he he liked doing doing things well. Tom was a he was a hard worker. Not only was he working at the fire department at the time, but I remember he was he was working off duty, um, refinishing cabinets. He would come in every day, and he had stain all over his hands. And he'd worked all day uh, the day before. You you never had to not you could always count on Tom. The engine was always ready. Uh, if we ever had a call, he was the first to jump in. Tom was a hard worker and. He was dedicated to what he did. As a firefighter, we're there a third of our lives. So we're, a lot of times, we're, we spend more time, you know, at the fire station than you do at home sometimes. And when you go home, you're, you're tired and you wanna get a meal and get some sleep, you know. 
especially if we've had a particularly rough shift and we've been up for 24 hours or something, you want to go home and sleep. So he did work um, hazmat for a while and I remember him coming home and I think there was I don't know if it was a bomb or it like looked like a bomb, but they had to like suit up and go in. I forget, I think it was like at UCI. And so um, I remember him saying that it was like very stressful because he only did that for like a little while. In 1994, he earned his position as Captain Wall on engine 17, 38, and finally engine 21. During Tom's ever-changing career as a firefighter, he achieved advancements and kept his skill levels up to date. Eventually, he became an instructor for Academy 17. He always seemed to shine when he was doing his job better than the other guys. Not trying to outdo everybody or any per particular person, just giving everything he had to get it right. A lot of guys, um, being a fireman is a job wasn't a job for Tom. We're in uh, inside Kim's house and then there's a, a neighbor ran over to Kim's and said that their backyard was on fire. We went out the front. Tom was in his uh, shorts and t-shirt and flip-flops and saw the fire in the neighbor's backyard. Ran over, jumped over the fence. I went with him. We grabbed a couple of garden hoses and uh, he was directing me. I never put out fire before. I had no idea what I was doing. And he directed me to where I put the put the water and uh, we knocked down the fire. And by the time the fire department got there, the fire was out. And Tom was out there with the water hose, his flip flops and shorts, but not the fire. Most of the fires you have in a fire station, if the, you know, you get called out on are not really big. They're, you know, handled usually by one engine. Not the major fires that you see on TV, although they happen all the time. They're, they were at a brush fire and for whatever reason, my dad left his turncoat in the truck, uh, in the fire engine. And I think they were just surveying stuff at the time. They were trying to figure out like where they, where they were gonna park and actually start um, fighting this brush fire. The wind had changed really drastically and the fire was then like getting blown against the side of this, this hill, but it was basically gonna start a burn behind the, the fire engine. And so they needed to move the truck like, real quick. And it wasn't my dad, it was, it was another firefighter had jumped into the uh, cab and hit the air brake, but there was all this fire and wind nearby and the air brakes like sucked up fire into the, the cab of the truck. Basically, there was a big fireball inside the, the cab. One of the reasons that that firefighter didn't get really burned was because he reached over it just instinctually and grabbed my dad's turncoat and threw it over his head. That, that basically saved him. They joked about it all the time, like <laughs> at the firehouse and stuff like that, just ribbing each other like they do. He was very well versed in what he was doing. He'd been doing it a long time. Um, no, he was doing what he loved, so I let him do it. And I wanted him to have peace of mind that I wasn't worrying about him. That morning, he, uh, we got along so well that I would go to work extra early in the morning. I would show up at like seven, wait for him to get out of the shower, give him a coffee, sit down and just BS for a while, and then go over the events of what happened the day before. And we did the same thing that morning. Wind was howling, Santa Ana winds. I was getting ready to leave and I felt kind of uneasy and I just turned to him and says, you probably ought to make sure the engine's ready to go out of county because I think you're gonna be gone by noon. And he was, he, I think they were dispatched about 11 in the morning to Riverside. I was on the engine company with Tom. It was uh, Tom, myself, and a firefighter. And about, as I remember, about 10.30 or 11, sometime around there we got a on a strike team to go to uh, Cal Cala Mesa area for a brush fire. Uh, we got there and fought the fire. Eventually the fire got into some structures. And at one point, uh, I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention. I was watching the uh, engine. The battalion chief we had at the time said, uh, kind of keep an eye on Tom. He was over 
off to the side, and he said he doesn't look real good. And at that time, at that point, uh, some Riverside paramedics and also Orange County Fire Department paramedics went over and kind of were talking with him. Uh, next time I looked, they had put uh, some oxygen on Tom, and still didn't think too much about it. I went over and said, "How do you feel?" And he says, oh, "You know, I'm, you know, I feel okay." As time progressed, and I uh, looked back again, and uh, they were doing a the medics uh, were doing CPR on Tom. On October 5th, 1998, Captain Thomas Wall died while battling the California Taylor wildfire in Riverside County. He was working on a roof, trying to save a home that had caught fire from burning embers. He had been fighting the fire for over 10 hours when he collapsed. My phone rang and it was from a cousin in Arizona. I go, what's up? And and Debbie says, well, we heard a fireman was killed from Orange County. And I, I said, what are you talking about? I didn't even know that they had gone. I was just home doing stuff around the house. So she told me, so I turned on the news and found out they had been dispatched to the Taylor fire in Riverside. And then they switched over with the live helicopter footage of a strike team of structure engines and a crew working a guy doing CPR on the ground. And then the phone rang again, it was my mom. She was crying, she says, thank God you're alive. And I go, what's going on? And she says, a fireman from, from Orange County. And I said, Orange County? She says, yeah, they said Tustin. Well, the department wasn't releasing the name. They weren't notifying anybody. So I immediately, jumped on my car and drove back to the fire station. And the, the word was starting to come in that somebody had been killed. I worked that night and uh, two firefighters died. We heard on the radio. That's probably one of the saddest days I've ever experienced in the fire service. It was uh, devastating for not only me, for everybody. Because you always think I'll be okay. It's not going to be a big deal. Just go out, do the job, get it done, come back. You don't think that when you left home, that's the last time you'll see home. I remember hearing rumors that somebody on the fire in Riverside, one of our guys, had gone down. I was at an association meeting the day that Tom, the incident happened. He went on a strike team out in the Riverside area on a brush fire. And then some more information came in and we heard that it was, you know, one of our guys from our station. And then we heard it was Tom and that he had had a heart attack. And I was the lucky one to answer the door. When the chaplain came, they asked, there was the chief and the cat chaplain and they asked for my mom. And um, so I went and got her. And then I immediately went into my little brother's room and got him and told him that he needed to come quick, that something happened to dad. And so we waited in the hallway, and I just remember um, praying that he was alive. And I guess a part of me knew that he wasn't. About 9.30 or so, there was a knock on the door, and because we'd been working with the, the chief and various people with the fire department, with Tom's fireman having died, I don't know, Megan went to the door to look to see who it was, and she turned around and said, it's firemen. And Joel came out in the living room, and he's like, what? And Meg said, come over here with me. And I remember I walked past them, and I'm like, what? What's going on? You know, what are you thinking? Anyway, they stayed. And Meg told me that she said to him, wait. And he's like, wait for what? She goes, you'll know. I don't know, she just had this very distinctive gut feeling and when I opened the door I was the chief and and I went well hi how are you and he looked like you know I'd slapped him or something and I said Tom's not here and he he said um, we know then it was the chaplain that I'd sat next to at, at Alan's funeral and I was not putting it together at all it just never occurred to me that something was wrong and anyway he said that Tom had had a heart attack. And I said, well, where is he? And I, he said, he did not survive it. I couldn't absorb that. I must have 
made some sort of moan or something. I made a noise and because Megan opened the door and she and Joel asked what was going on. And I told them that their dad had died and it's just not something you, you ever think you're ever gonna say out loud. As soon as my mom started crying, we opened the door and she told us just all of a sudden, like all of our family was like at our house, like pretty immediately. And a lot of people from the church that we were going to at the time, just remember it being like this whirlwind, you know? I was at home. I remember getting a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. I was like, well, why? I couldn't understand why he would be calling me because it never happened. Like never got calls from other firefighters to me directly. He uh, he called me and was like, you know, this is, uh, I work with your dad. And I was like, didn't believe him. <laughs> and I, I think I hung up on him. <laughs> I was like, I'm like, I don't, this isn't, this guy's like trying to, this is a, a scam phone call or whatever, hung up. And he called me right back. So he like gave me all the information. I was like, okay, this guy's probably who he says he is. He's like, I need your address because I need to come pick you up. And I was like, okay. So he shows up comes inside, he's like, your dad's in the hospital, I need to take you to your your house. Chuck told me this, the battalion chief, he said that he was really proud of him, how he reacted, and that when he said he needed to come with him, and he was like, well, who are you, and why do I need to go with you? And he didn't want to just, he didn't want to be the one to tell him, or rather tell, he just wanted to get him to us. And, uh, they, they brought him back to the house and uh, he, he was very, very grown up. He, he was like the man of the house, you know. At that point, he wanted to take care of us. He's a sweet man, my Ian. I was sitting out here uh, the morning that he died. I had no clue about, his, about that being the end of the day. But I was looking at the patio cover thinking that uh, I was in pretty bad shape, had some termite issues, and I was looking at it thinking about taking it down. And of course, Tom was on my mind because he helped me put it up. While I was sitting here, looking off in that direction, I saw some smoke, which reminded me of Tom too, because of course he was a fireman. That evening, I was at work and my son called me, Darren called me, and. He didn't know how to tell me any other way. He just told me that Tom died. Tom is dead. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I remember sitting on the couch and the TV was on. The house still packed and it's later at night now. I, I looked up at the uh, television and the newscast is on and it was right then is when picture of my dad's on and the news reporters like talking about uh, how he passed away and I like lost it at that point. I don't even think I knew like what call he was on or what he was doing at work that day until after the fact. Joel was only 15, but that was like I said about 9.30 and I bet within a half an hour there were 50 people at the house. The neighbors started hearing and bringing stuff over and my family came over and the department went and picked up Tom's mom to bring him over. And um, there were people there all night taking care of us. It was just a horrible loss. Just a huge, a huge hole there that uh, you couldn't fill. All of a sudden it was like, bam, this like huge life change, you know? It's like having the, the floor pulled out from underneath you. you probably felt like he was just getting to know his dad. And then Megan was her birthday when all of the hoopla started. When she got married, you know, because honestly that was my first thought was who's going to walk her down the aisle. And um, so her brothers did. From the moment Megan was born, Tom looked forward to the day he would walk her down the aisle and give her away so she might experience the fulfillment that he and Chris had found. Unfortunately, he would not be there to see that day come to fruition. I took it pretty hard. I kind of stayed away from a few people for a while. Thank God my wife was around because she understood what was going on inside. And I think everybody in the station was having the same problem with it. 
this could happen to any of us. I never expected it in Tom, so it even had more significance because Tom seemed like a healthy, happy, go home after work, family guy, and all of a sudden he's gone. I mean, we were the same age, you know, great friends. We'd worked together for quite some time. Every year we see reports of firemen dying and, and it's kind of sanitized because we don't know them. They're from this agency or that agency or they're in Wyoming or Northern California. And then it hits you like a fist in the face. It's your friend that was killed. But for the grace of God, you could have been the one. But the fire happened when he was on it. No one would have expected what happened that day. I think uh, it brought a lot of us closer together. I think for me, that's what got me through it is the fact that it's not chaos. My belief is there's a reason everything happens. Uh, when you die, you don't cease to exist. You continue. Uh, yeah, it was a very sad day. It still is a sad day when I think about it. Just wish the guy was back. Wish I could snap my fingers and or wake up and this whole thing was a nightmare. It's a huge loss. You know, to this day, I still think of it. Tom and I had a pact that was done years prior that we had a, a captain, a really good guy that had some sage advice for us, for all firemen is, hey, make sure you have a friend that you can count on should you pass away. Because the family, there'd be, it'd be too, too much of an emotional event. And Tom and I talked about it. I'd be his, he'd be mine. Never brought it up prior to that event. It, would, it probably took place seven, eight years prior to his death. On October 10th, 1998, 1800 firefighters marched alongside his flag-draped coffin to pay homage to a fallen hero and comrade. I'll tell you right now that uh, the day before when Chris and I was, were discussing it, I said, I said to her, you know, there's going to be a lot of people there. And uh, if I start getting choked up, because I was choked up, do something, make an ugly face or something, you know. So I got up there and I, and I addressed everybody and I started to talk and I started choking up. And I just happened to look down the front row and there was Chris and she just looked at me and stuck her tongue out with a big smile. It's like, okay, we're okay, we can go with this, you know, and I got through it. I loved him as a friend, but also admired him as a family member because of his relationship with his wife and especially his children. At the funeral, they shut down Tustin Avenue, like Main Street and everything. Um, and there was 3,000 people there. I'd never seen that many people at a funeral that I personally attended ever in my life. There was helicopters and like all kinds of stuff. The entire Orange County Fire Department had like a whole procession down the Main Street. The house that my dad helped save, that like he died there. That family actually came to the funeral and they were like super thankful and everything, like super nice people. It's important to cherish those things, people in your life and stuff like that, because you don't know when the last time you're going to talk to them is, you know. My wife went to the services with me and she, she was awestruck. She couldn't believe the remembrance, the celebration, how everyone stuck together, came together for Tom and his family. Each alarm was sounded by a bell. It called them to fight fires and to place their lives in jeopardy for the good of their fellow man. And when the fire was on and the alarm had been completed, it was the bell that signaled its end. This day we seek strong words and symbols that give us a better understanding of our feelings when we experience such a loss. And we use these symbols and words to reflect the devotion of our brother Tom for his duties. The sounding of a bell, a special signal of three rings, three times each, represented the end of their duties and that they were returning to quarters. And so now, 
On this day, Tom Wall has completed his tasks. His duties well done. He has given his best. And for our dear brother, his last alarm, he has gone home. The OCPFA President Joe Kerr once said, Anytime you see a firefighter sweating in the heat of battle, anytime you see a friend working to help another, anytime you see a virtuous act by someone who does not want the recognition, someone who does not hesitate to act, someone who will help out whenever there's a need, you see Tom. I believe we will see him again. I mean, that's why firemen so fight so hard to keep people alive on medical calls, is because they don't want their family to suffer. And sometimes we get lucky, and oftentimes we don't. Yeah, I mean, and being 18, I always uh, would laugh because I'm like, it got, my teenage years were not uh, the like carefree, you're gonna live forever, like the immortal, like you have this idea that like nothing bad's gonna happen to you when you're 18, 19, 20. Those, that was not my, that was not my uh, reality, I guess. And my brother was young, so my brother's the youngest. Um, and I, unfortunately, I think it like cut their relationship short. I remember everybody trying to keep us real busy, right? And uh, some of the women from church wanted me to go with them to a, a a craft fair. I think it was probably in Anaheim. It's kind of like not knowing what to do with your arms. You know, you're just sort of like, I don't know what, what I'm doing. But I was standing on a corner of, of a street and nobody was around me for a brief moment. And I remember feeling incredibly small on the earth and like Tom was my protective bubble and it was like, that was gone. And I, it almost felt like right then, I wouldn't have been surprised if all of gravity let loose in me and I just floated off. It was really hard on my mom too, because I think she ended up locking herself in her room for like three days, and like wasn't eating or anything. And uh, I don't even think she would really talk to anybody. That was super rough, especially because my brother and sister were younger at the time. I had never gone through this before, so I didn't know what to do. <laughs> Just no playbook, right? It was a rough time, but we ended up uh, pulling through okay, I think. <laughs> Tom had a special connection with those he helped. He was a walking, breathing blessing to everyone. Anybody and everybody came before Tom. He was also a rock for fellow firefighters as he guided them through loss and pain, walking with them as a friend throughout personal triumphs and defeats. An ironic example of this commitment was when Tom's own firefighter, Alan Donnellan, had just passed away, and Tom became deeply involved as the family's liaison and friend. Tom was there absorbing as much of the pain as possible from Alan's widow, Kara. Chris thought of Tom as a very humble man who did not take praise and appreciation easily. 
he didn't understand all the attention surrounding himself at Alan's funeral. After all, he was just doing what came naturally. We had lost his fireman, Alan Donlan, about a month earlier. Alan was a, a rookie for me. And when he finished his probation, uh, he, had to, he had to leave. He had to go to uh, be assigned to a station after he was done with his training. And I wanted to keep him, but I couldn't. I didn't have the positions for him. And Tom did, so Tom grabbed him, and we, uh, and he went to work for Tom, and uh, he passed away in a hospital 17 days after surgery that went bad. We all took it hard. Tom took it really hard. You could see the tears in his eyes when we found out that morning that Alan had passed away. And then, fast speed, 30 days later, we lose Tom. And I said to the guys, I said, this firehouse has never lost anybody on a fire. And we need to remember these two guys. And this was built um, by the guys at the station. I believe our union helped financially and our benevolent association. It was built on duty by um, the guys at the station, but specifically Joe Garcia. He's since retired, um, but he does all the masonry stuff. Uh, and so he built the whole thing. It's got lights that we have a switch. We can turn the lights on at night. It actually really looks nice. He, he left a big impact on the department. And, um, you know, I know that's why we have this is so that we don't forget that we remember uh, the, the people and the families that are involved in our department and, and affect us and um, leave those memories with us. I know I, I said to myself at, at his funeral, I, looking at the flag and just kind of chuckled and said, someday I'm coming up there, buddy, and I'm not going to be your rookie. Make sure the coffee's hot and make sure I have clean turnouts and we'll be on the engine up there together. But I think all firemen think that, you know, that when we die, we're greeted by all our brothers up there as well as our family members. I know when my time comes that Tom Wall will be standing up there with a big grin on his face and a cup of coffee ready for me. The last conversation I had with him was on his birthday at my Aunt Kim's. And I remember him calling me, well, my mom had called me and said, hey, come out for your dad's birthday, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, ah, I got to do laundry and all this stuff around the house. And I got work tomorrow and like driving all the way out to Riverside is like this huge thing. I'll like, I'll see you next week or whatever, right? And uh, I didn't know it at the time but uh, that was gonna be the last time I talked to my dad. And he called back and asked me to like come over or whatever. And, and I was super stubborn. Um, he's like, oh, your mom will do your laundry for you and stuff, like come out or whatever. And it was one of those things where I'm like, no, I'm not gonna like let my parents take care of me anymore. I'm gonna do it on my own <laughs> type of thing. Yeah, that was the last time I got to talk to him was telling him I wasn't gonna show up to his birthday party, <laughs> which sucks. I remember things and smile, you know. I don't know how to explain it. It's like a memory of an old lost friend that you all of a sudden calls you on the phone, you start talking if you're really good. And, and every time that I was near Tom, talking to Tom, doing anything with Tom, it was always fun. Never any problems. Just the guy was a joy to be around. You'd, uh, if you were stressed and he walked in, the stress would go away. He just had, he would, had that kind of charisma about him. Tom is survived by his wife, Christine, his daughter, Megan, and his sons, Ian and Joel. He is remembered as a hero who courageously gave his life in the loving service of others. You know, we're supposed to grow old together. Um, I visualized that part of our foundation under our house had been blown away because I was a fireman's wife though and he was gone so much it just if in a sort of an unreal way it felt like he just was on an extended you know assignment or something With you uh, 
having started your own company, how do you think your dad would have reacted to that? I thought I think he would have loved it, because um, I mean he he ran his own uh, carpentry business on the side, you know, doing he was like finishing cabinets and doing stuff like that on the side anyway. A lot of firefighters have side work stuff that they do anyway, so he lost his dad around the same age, and that also like changes changed a, a lot of the way I perceived things that he did or, or talked about as well because he had that experience. So looking back on it through that lens kind of changes the way you perceive those memories too. Because now you have this like weird common bond that you didn't have before, but you also can't talk to them about it. So, I mean, he, we used to play like a lot of music together and stuff like that. My dad started playing guitar when he was like 35, like around my age now. And he like loved playing songs about having a, a dad, growing up with your dad, or losing your father, or that type of stuff. And I played those songs with him, so it's kind of weird to think about that in hindsight. He, you know, he wanted to be a grandpa and stuff, and I've got two kids, and you know, I think he would be totally stoked. Joel would follow in his dad's footsteps, sharing his same passion and inspiration for music. I think about that, like uh, he'd probably come over with his guitar and play with the kids, you know, and play for them. My kids like to sing too, so I think they would have had a great time. I think he would have just like really enjoyed just hanging out with them, you know? I mean, I think he would just say like, try to enjoy life as much as you can. Find the good moments and the fun moments and cling on to those, I guess. I would think Tom's message to any of us would be focused around his family. Um, he was a strong, strong family guy. He loved his family. I think Tom, Tom would probably tell me when you get stressed, if you get down for some reason, just uh, stop, take a big breath, look up, see the sun and realize that tomorrow's coming. He'd probably say, dude, you've been eating pretty good, huh? <laughs> we lost a lot when we lost Tom. He stands out more than a lot of the others, that I, friends that I've had. But he was going places. He was going to do good things for people. I do have this really weird memory from when I was, I, I was real little, I was like, a baby. I was probably under three years old. I remember because uh, we lived in a in the house that I was born in was in Santa Ana. We had horses on the property. Like I have a memory of him carrying me and like watching a uh, bull be born. For whatever reason, I have this memory of like him standing out by the by the pen and watching this this baby horse be born. Weird memory. Tom knew how to listen to people. As I said before, he, he knew how to make people feel important. And he had that wide smile on his face whenever he saw you. As if um, he had been just waiting for you to come in that door. I really try to make people feel that way when I see them. I'm sure I fall short of Tom's excellence in that, but um, it's something I aspire to be like all, at all times. And so I have.
like it. <laughs> what about you, Maggie? The camera moves and everybody moves to the... <laughs> That's one of the things that happened to the camera. The camera never stands still. Taking a little nap. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. They're always getting sick on this. Yeah, you know best. <laughs> 